Thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. The world is changed. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air. Once that once was is lost, for none now live who smell it. Two terms that are used almost interchangeably are climate change and global warming. While there is a technical distinction between the two, I'd argue that fundamentally global warming is abstract, while climate change is experienced. The entire planet warming by one or two degrees is abstract. Wildfires raging in your country for several weeks longer per year is experienced. More frequent and more extreme heat waves are experienced. Living far from the equator and becoming more likely to catch tropical diseases is experienced. But experiences also include the more mundane things, like food and drink tasting different or becoming more scarce. For example, coffee is likely to be more difficult to grow in a warmer climate, meaning it'll be more expensive. But another mundane experience that's likely to change is smell. The world will smell different in the future, to us and to other species. And the world's actually already started to see some scents go missing. And we can expect many more to go extinct in the coming years. But smells go extinct all the time. For example, some technical smells like telephone books and Polaroid film, and also social smells like smoky, beer-soaked pubs are all but extinct, at least here in the UK. And we can in fact preserve scents for future generations in a kind of smell archive. More on that later. So smells disappearing from nature in itself isn't something that should concern future generations. But what happens after those smells go missing is another matter entirely. For example, the ocean now smells different. Not perceptibly to us, but very much so to certain marine species. This is because smells are fundamentally chemicals that are absorbed by our sensory organs and interpreted by our brains. In the atmosphere, those chemicals are transported by air, mostly oxygen and nitrogen, from their source to our nose. In the ocean, of course, those chemicals are instead transported by water. However, ocean water has gradually been becoming more acidic due to increased carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere dissolving into it and forming carbonic acid. On a molecular level, this means that there are more H plus ions floating around than there were before. And the extra electric charge in those H plus ions can change the shape of a scent molecule when it's suspended in water. And how animals detect those scent molecules is highly dependent on their shape. So the same molecule in a slightly different shape could be misinterpreted or entirely missed by sensory organs. One specific example of this that researchers have identified is in shore crabs. Female shore crabs carry eggs on them and ventilate them by wafting water over the eggs, knowing when to do this based on the kind of smell that the eggs give off. But in more acidic waters, the female crabs aren't able to smell their eggs as well, meaning they're not capable of ventilating the eggs as effectively. And so the number of viable offspring that each crab will on average produce decreases. But more generally, if a smell like, say, the smell of food or of a predator is less detectable to marine life forms, then that makes their lives much more difficult. Add to that the fact that more acidic water results in at least some fish producing fewer smell receptors and causes organisms to struggle to form hard shells. In fact, their shells may even start to dissolve in the water if it becomes particularly acidic. There is the very real possibility that ocean biodiversity will collapse as a result of this climate change driven ocean acidification. All it would take would be a few species to go extinct due to these sensory pressures and the ripples would be felt throughout the ecosystem there very likely would be a cascade of species ceasing to exist, and the oceans going quiet. But that's just the situation in the sea caused by water becoming more acidic. Here on land, we face a different problem. Flowering plants are starting to smell less. This is for a couple of reasons. Firstly, air pollution, such as ozone and nitrous oxides from car exhausts, are reacting with scent molecules in the air before they reach our noses, meaning that the average distance a scent molecule can travel is reduced. So we can't smell flowers from further away, but more importantly, neither can pollinators like bees. 
Secondly, at least some species of flowers produce fewer aroma-producing compounds when grown in higher temperatures than those grown at normal temperatures, so the plants are just smelling less. And thirdly, some plants emit different scents if they are stressed. A classic example is the smell of freshly mown grass. That smell is actually a defence mechanism by the grass plant, warning other nearby grass plants that they might be damaged soon, and also stimulating new growth in the damaged plant. But stress isn't always mechanical and a lack of water or the temperature being too high can alter the scent given off by a plant. All of these reasons together produce a world that smells different, and smells less. As I already said, that's hugely troubling for pollinating species in particular, and hence for the reproduction of plants. And the outlook for this century doesn't look good. 40% of all plant species are at risk of extinction due to climate change and other human interference, and 46% of all flowering plants are. If we don't do something about this, soon, the world will smell very different to our children and to their children, and a fundamental building block of the global ecosystem will have been removed. And just like with the oceans, that will have a cascading effect on other species. You simply can't survive if the flowering plant that you feed on doesn't exist anymore, and neither can the species that are symbiotic with you, or the species that predate on you. As I mentioned earlier though, it is possible to archive smells, and these techniques have actually been used to bring a smell back from the dead of several extinct flower species. Basically, you take a sample of a smell and look at the molecules that are present in that sample, separating them out and then using mass spectroscopy to identify which compounds make up that smell and in what relative concentration. So to recreate the smell, you just put together a mix of those compounds in their correct relative proportions. It's a bit like learning how to make a salad by buying one and disassembling it into its component parts, and counting how many lettuce leaves and tomatoes and cucumber slices go into a salad. But there are problems with this. For example, how do you choose which smells get preserved? If you only have finite storage space and a finite amount of time to do the procedure, then you're going to have to pick certain smells as being worthy of being remembered. And who gets to decide? If it was up to me, I'd probably pick a smell like, say, an English woodland in summer, but that's going to mean nothing to somebody from South America, for example. But more importantly, while preserving smells is great and all, it does nothing to preserve the biodiversity that will be lost in those smells' absence in the natural world. So while we could preserve smells for future generations, and I think there's an argument that we should, we'd be better off stopping those smells from disappearing in the first place and addressing the root cause climate change. Climate change is a many-headed hydra, impacting so many parts of our shared existence on this planet. The experiences of weather, of smell, of food, of wildlife, and it will take a range of strategies to defeat. But fundamentally, it's very simple. Keep the carbon in the ground. Don't put it in the air. Instead, let's keep that air filled with the smell of flowers and forests and a world rich in nature. To quote a certain hobbit, it's worth fighting for. I'll be honest, I was never particularly good at chemistry. I never really clicked with the subject. And now that I'm more than a few years out of school, there aren't many opportunities for me to improve my knowledge beyond just learning cool facts on the internet. Enter Brilliant. Brilliant is an educational website and app that offers a variety of expertly written courses on subjects in science, maths, and computer science, including an introductory course to chemistry. If you'd like to learn more about how acids like carbonic acid introduce H ions into a mix, then this is a great place to learn. Crucially, Brilliant isn't about learning cool facts, it's about learning the processes that underpin chemistry and neural networks and electricity and so many other subjects. It's about getting your hands dirty and answering problems, and emphasising that if you get an answer wrong, that's more than okay because you learn from the experience. Brilliant is all about learning by doing. To me, this is what education is all about, and I'm so happy that Brilliant have become a long-term sponsor of this channel. In the time that we've worked together, they've massively improved the interactivity of their problems, and they've added dozens of new subjects. Brilliant is a perfect resource for adults who want to improve their understanding of science and maths, but also for students students who want to supplement their learning in the classroom. If you'd like to get 20% off a year of STEM learning in your browser or on your phone, then head to brilliant.org slash Simon Clark and get your hands dirty solving some problems. Thank you again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Thank you for watching the video. I realised that this one was really rather depressing. 
Sorry. But I think it's important to talk about these topics because it shows how pervasive climate change is and how it will affect everyday existence. So if you did enjoy the video, please do pop it a like. And if you want some recommended viewing, here's some up here. That just leaves me to say thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.